T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Main engine start, zero, and lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Seeking clues to the planetary puzzle about life on Mars. The program is in right on time. 180 operating resources plus, as expected. And throttling down to 76%. Program complete. And MSL is now breaking the sound barrier. SRB chamber pressures following the nominal curve. Everything will And we pass through max Q. We're on closed loop on Atlas PU. Signatures as expected. SRB profile continues to look nominal. Throttling back up to 100% thrust on the RD-180. Engine parameters looking good. Flight control disturbances look as expected. SRB pressures running right as expected. Coming up on SRB burnout, we have burnout of the SRBs. Everything is looking good. 10 seconds to SRB jet. And we have first pair and second pair. Both sets of SRBs have successfully jettisoned the vehicle. We've re-enabled guidance. Everything is Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Remember, you may submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button on the Zoom platform. We will now begin our program with an introduction from Carnegie President Eric Isaacs. Good afternoon. On behalf of everyone here at Carnegie Institution for Science, I want to thank you all for joining us, which will be our last presentation of the summer in this virtual lecture series. Uh, for those of you that have been with us since the beginning, we began the series back in April after the spread of COVID-19 forced us to postpone what our usual scheduled program was, which is the Capital Science Evening Public Talks. And we decided we wanted to find a safe, accessible way to share our ongoing work with you and to help our supporters stay engaged with the discoveries that are happening here at Carnegie. And we've been really gratified that our work has been so meaningful to so many of you and uh, has drawn such an exquisite audience for virtual presentations on topics broad range from astronomy to global ecology uh, to, to microbiology. The virtual uh, series has drawn thousands of participants and it has really been a privilege uh, for us to join you in these conversations. So today I'm very pleased to present our colleague Shona Morrison, a research scientist here in DC at our Earth and Planets Laboratory. She came here to Carnegie as a postdoc after earning her bachelor's degree in geology from Georgia Southwestern State University and a PhD in geosciences from the University of Arizona. And she's been with us ever since. Dr. Morrison is a mineralogist and a planetary scientist. Uh, since 2012, she has been a member of the science team of the Mars Science Laboratory, which sent the Curiosity rover to Mars. And she is an expert on using big data techniques to, if you'll pardon the expression, dig into Martian geology. Among other, uh, among other of her projects, she has been analyzing data that's been back from the Curios sent back from the Curiosity, Curiosity rover's chemistry and mineralogy instrumentation. And her work has made it possible to understand Martian mineralogical history at an unprecedented scale. It's actually very appropriate also that she's giving this presentation today. This morning, uh, we were able to watch NASA successfully launch the Mars Perseverance rover which has now left Earth's orbit and is on its seven month journey to the red planet. The rover is gonna seek uh, signs of ancient life, essentially a follow on to what, to what the, um, the earlier missions that Sean has been involved in the Curiosity rover 
Uh, it'll search for ancient life and collect rock and soil samples for possible return to Earth in the future. We're also proud that some of our own uh, Carnegie scientists have had a key hand in the design of this mission. So I'm sure that all of you are eager to hear Shauna's presentation, as so am I. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shauna Morrison. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Eric. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen now. And here we go. Okay, so again, thank you, Eric, for that, uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for coming, everyone who's online. Um, for those of you who are online uh, right at the beginning, before the introduction, you got to see the incredible footage of the Curiosity launch in 2011, which I have to say was one of the coolest things that I've ever had the privilege to witness and be a part of. And I hope many of you, uh, like Eric and myself, also got to see the launch of uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover this morning. Um, I, I feel really fortunate to be able to share with you some of my work on Mars as Perseverance is just beginning its journey to the Red Planet. Um, so uh, today I'm going to share with you some about the general, some general information about how and why we explore Mars and the NASA Mars Exploration Program. And then I'm going to delve a bit into my work, which involves studying minerals in order to address some of the outstanding questions related to Mars's geologic and biologic history. You see, minerals are some of the oldest physical materials that exist in our solar systems. And when they form, they capture a glimpse of their original formational environment and anything else that has happened to them along the way. And in a bit, I'll explain how we go about learning this information from minerals on Earth and Mars. So first, uh, why Mars? Um, why do we want to study it? Uh, firstly, it's the closest potentially habitable planet uh, near us, and it's one of the most likely candidates to have once hosted life. It had water, it had the necessary chemical components, which are sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, and it had geologic cycling. These are some of the key elements of habitability and the origin of life. Secondly, due to having some notable similarities to Earth, including its overall composition, size, and its proximity to the sun, Mars is an analog of early Earth. So we can study Mars to better understand what happened on our home planet billions of years ago before plate tectonics, and more importantly, life completely changed the way our planet looks and behaves. Here's some quick facts about Mars. A uh, day on Mars, which is called a soul, is about the length of a day on Earth, um, but that's just but it's just 37 minutes longer than our day. Uh, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but when we're working on a mission and we're working on Mars time, uh, which the Perseverance rover crew will be doing in, in seven months, uh, that means that one day uh, we're starting at 8 a.m. and the next day it's 8.37 and then it's a little bit after nine. And before you know it, your workday starts at 11 p.m. and then 3 a.m. So that small amount of time can make a pretty big difference in schedule. Uh, a Mars year is about twice as long as a year on Earth, and there are some pretty big temperature swings, but it can actually get reasonably warm during the summer near the equator, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Mars' atmosphere is 95% CO2, but it is significantly thinner than Earth's atmosphere. It has less than 1% of our atmospheric density. Mars' atmosphere wasn't always like this, though. Before it lost its magnetic field, it likely had an atmosphere much more like ours that protected the surface from the sun's harmful radiation and prevented water from evaporating and being lost to space. Uh, Mars also has about half the diameter of Earth and about one third of our gravity. So if you were standing on Mars right now, you'd feel a little lighter. And now let's talk a bit about the NASA Mars Exploration Program. Currently, there are four primary focus areas uh, in terms of Mars exploration and research. The first is life. With the goal of better understanding whether or not Mars ever supported life, uh, the second is climate, with the aim to characterize the climate history on Mars and the associated environments and processes. The third is geology with the goal to study and understand the planetary evolution and geologic history of Mars and the processes that shaped it through deep time. And lastly, humans. We wanna understand how we can best prepare for human exploration. Uh, that's the ultimate goal. And uh, this requires a very good understanding of the terrain, the climate, the composition, and certainly the levels of radiation on the surface. 
Mars exploration began over 50 years ago with a Mariner flyby mission launched in 1964, which captured the first up close photographs of the Martian surface. Prior to these images, scientists really didn't know what Mars was actually like. And finding geologic signs that water may have once flowed on the planet's surface really changed the way researchers viewed Mars. And it was now a candidate for having hosted life. The first landed missions were Viking 1 and 2 in the 1970s, and they provided the first photographs taken from the surface of Mars, as well as chemical analyses of Martian soil. These missions observed frost or ice on the ground during the winter, and ultimately it was thought to be primarily carbon dioxide ice or dry ice with some water ice. And they showed that Mars was much more chemically interesting and diverse than we'd originally expected. The first rover came in the mid 1990s as a part of the Pathfinder mission, which included landing a base station from which the rover Sojourner could explore. This mission ex uh, observed rounded pebbles and cobbles of rock, which here on Earth form as the result of moving water uh, in river deposits and things like that. And uh, therefore that suggested that during the wetter, warmer times of Mars's history, there may have been one running water. And uh, from this time onward, there were a string of orbiters and landers, as well as the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity, which launched in 2003. These twin geologists lasted much longer than anyone imagined they would. Spirit explored Gusev Crater for over six years. Bear in mind, their prime mission was supposed to be six months, so they went very long. Opportunity explore, explored Meridiani Planum and its various craters for more than 14 years until a dust storm in 2018 likely covered the solar panels, causing hibernation and loss of contact. Of course, that was sad, uh, but Spirit and Opportunity had amazing runs and made a lot of scientific discoveries, including detecting minerals like clays and gypsum that indicated the long-standing presence of liquid water and possible habitable environments. Also notably, Spirit captured a number of dust devils in Gusev Crater, which I just think is really cool. And it really indicates how much wind plays a role in shaping the surface of Mars, as well as how much material it can move around. Uh, these winds can result in global dust storms, which you can see in these images here, and these storms can completely obscure the Martian surface. Uh, so it was a storm like this um, that blocked the solar panels of Opportunity and similarly Spirit a few years prior. And in fact, during the dust storm that hibernated Opportunity, the dust was so thick that we were unable to communicate with Curiosity for a significant amount of time and we actually had to stop mission operations until the dust cleared. Which brings me to the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity rover mission. I'll talk more about this mission in a few minutes, but for now I'll say that Curiosity was the largest rover ever sent to another planetary body. She weighs nearly a ton and is about the size of a Mini Cooper, so you can see me here uh, in the test bed rover for scale. Uh, she also has the most advanced scientific instrument payload to date. And rather than having solar panels like most other spacecraft used for their power, she has a nuclear battery. So while we may lose communication during dust storms, there's no risk of losing power due to the sun being blocked. A newer really neat mission to Mars is the InSight lander. It landed on the surface in late 2018. And this mission is unique, especially because it has a seismometer, which is used to detect any seismic activity. Uh, it also has a temperature gauge that will go relatively deep into the subsurface, much deeper than we've gone before. And this mission essentially seeks to uncover how Mars formed and evolved by investigating the interior structure and composition. And it will determine the rate of Martian tectonic activity, as well as meteorite impacts, so rocks crashing into the surface can be detected with the seismometer. Uh, Mars has long been thought of as a tectonically relatively inactive planet, um, but as of September 2019, InSight had detected 174 seismic events, all of which were consistent with tectonic activity rather than meteorite impacts. So this mission is really changing the way we're thinking about uh, the interior of Mars and the level of activity there. The last mission I'd like to mention is, of course, the one who launched today. Uh, Mars 2020 is based on the technology built for Curiosity, so it's about the same size and weight, but it has a slightly different payload and a notable difference in goals, which Eric mentioned earlier. Um, that goal of this mission is to be the first step in preparing for sample return from Mars. 
There are still many scientific instruments on the rover, including chemical detection and some mineralogical detection equipment, but there's also a sample caching system in which the rover will drill rock cores, put them in a small tube, and place them on the surface to be picked up for sample return, hopefully by 2031. So now let's transition over to the Mars Science Laboratory or MSL mission and how we explore Mars and some of our findings. Our primary scientific goal is to explore and quantitatively assess a local region of Mars surface as a potential habitat for life, past or present, and to characterize the geologic history of that area. Um, I'd also like to mention that we're less than a week away from, our, or exactly a week away, from our eighth anniversary on Mars. So um, eight years going strong, and uh, Eric and I were just discussing uh, before everyone got on that we're probably going to be able to go for at least 13 years with our nuclear battery, so we're not slowing down. Uh, Curiosity has 17 cameras and 10 scientific instruments, including the Kemen instrument, which is here inside the body of the rover. Kemen stands for chemistry and mineralogy, and it's an X-ray diffraction instrument that definitively detects and analyzes minerals. You can see here on the map of Mars where Curiosity is located relative to the other missions. We are right near the equator, not too far from InSight uh, and Perseverance, actually. So we're located inside Gale Crater, which is home to Aeolus Mons. We call this uh, Mount Sharp, uh, just our nickname is Mount Sharp. And it's a five kilometer high mound of sedimentary rock laid down over billions of years of Martian geologic history. And therefore these layers of rock give us the opportunity to sample a huge swath of geologic environments that were deposited over a long period of time. One of these sedimentary units, uh, particularly laden with the iron mineral hematite, was named Vera Rubin Ridge after the famed Carnegie astronomer Vera Rubin, whose large body of work included uh, proving the existence of dark matter. As I mentioned earlier, an important piece of understanding the geologic history of a sample or of a crater or of a planet is understanding its mineralogy and the composition of those minerals because they can tell us a lot of important information about their formational conditions and any subsequent weathering and alteration and even provide evidence for habitable conditions. To give you an idea of the scale of the terrain we're covering, you can see the lower reaches of Mount Sharp on the left. And that tiny boulder circled here, which you probably can't even see on your screen, is about the size of the rover. So we've had to surmount some pretty serious terrain. We traveled quite a distance, over 14 miles, and we've sampled many, many sites with the various scientific instruments. Most of the material we're dealing with is sediment in the form of sand dunes, such as these gorgeous Namib dunes here. We're seeing with curiosity taking a selfie. And, uh, or sedimentary rock, which include a few sandstones that were once uh, part of a delta, which is a, a similar environment to actually where Perseverance is on its way to now in Jezero Crater. Uh, we also see um, we also see conglomerates, which contain those rounded pebbles that I mentioned earlier and represents a fluvial or river deposit, and a lot of mudstones, which were deposited in a lacustrine or a lake environment. That's the majority of what we see. Kemen has sampled over 25 rock and soil samples so far, and we sample in two ways. One is by scooping up loose sediment, as you can see here on the bottom right, and the other is by drilling rock and scooping up the drill finds, as you can see here in the upper left. Once we've scooped up the sample material, we use the rover's arm to deliver it to the Kemen instrument inside the body of the rover. We only need a very small amount of sample, roughly the volume of a baby aspirin. It's not a lot, as you can see here as it dumps it into the cell. So we pour that sample material into one of our 27 reusable sample cells and we move that cell in front of our x-ray source. We then shoot the rock material with our x-ray beam and the x-rays hit the mineral grains and bounce off in a very specific way. This bouncing off is called diffraction, and each mineral has a unique X-ray diffraction pattern, which we record with our detector. Our sample cell is vibrating and moving the material around while we analyze, so that the beam can hit the many mineral phases in, in each sample. And you can see that the diffracted X-rays hitting our detector here uh, are resulting in a two-dimensional X-ray diffraction pattern. So that's those circles you'll see, and I'll, I'll show you more in a moment. Um, so here you can, you can see what an X-ray diffraction or XRD pattern looks like. Each mineral has a unique XRD pattern like a fingerprint. 
And it allows us to determine what it is. And with some detailed calibration of the instrument, we're also able to tell very precisely what the chemical composition is of that mineral species. So we're able to determine, uh, we're also able to determine the abundance of each mineral in the sample. So I now know how much of each mineral is present, which can be very telling of geologic conditions. Now I use the term mineral a lot, um, but what actually is a mineral? It's a naturally occurring solid with a well-defined chemical composition like the olivine you see here, which is a magnesium silicate and a well-defined crystal structure, which is the arrangement of atoms that is repeated over and over again to form a crystal. These two characteristics are entirely determined by the chemical, physical, geological, and sometimes biological environment in which they form. Meaning that if we know the chemistry and the structure, we can actually reverse that equation and determine the formational environment, which is really useful when we're trying to characterize the geologic history and habitability of another planet like Mars. A good example of a mineral that tells us about its formational environment is gypsum. Gypsum is an evaporite mineral, and we have actually found this in Gale Crater. And we know that uh, it forms as the result of the drying up of a freshwater lake. If we find another type of evaporite mineral like halite, which is simply common table salt that you and I eat every day, we know that it formed due to the evaporation of a saline or salty body of water. So if we suspect that there was a standing body of water on Mars, we can look at the type of evaporite minerals to determine if that water was salty or fresh. And we can also figure out if that body of water had a neutral pH or what the other conditions were that may have affected the habitability of that environment. We can even go a little farther than saying simply which mineral is present. We can actually estimate the chemical elements or atoms that are present in the mineral beyond their idealized chemical formula. For instance, looking at olivine, which is very abundant on our planet, making up most of our upper mantle, but it's not very stable at the surface, so that's why you don't see it a lot. Um, the olivine we're seeing here is the magnesium version, which is called forsterite. It has an ideal composition of two magnesium atoms, one silicon atom, and four oxygen atoms. But in reality, there are other elements mixed in. Most commonly for olivine, that element is iron. The iron version of olivine is called phalite, but again, in nature, we rarely see an olivine crystal that is all iron or all magnesium. What we actually see is some mixture of the two, which can tell us about the formational temperature and the composition of the magma from which it formed. Let's take a look at how we do that. Here we have the crystal structure of magnesium olivine. The green atoms are magnesium, the blue are silicon, and the red are oxygen. You can see that the magnesium is pretty small. And when we replace the magnesium atoms with iron atoms in the crystal structure, you can see that the entire structure becomes larger. And it turns out that the way uh, that when you add more and more iron to olivine, the crystal structure size increases in a very regular and systematic way. So by data mining a lot of experimental data from laboratory measurements and using some advanced statistics and data science techniques, we can actually statistically characterize the relationship between the crystal structure size and the amount of iron. What this means is that when I get an x-ray diffraction, when I get x-ray diffraction data from ChemN that tells me the size of the crystal structure, I can actually predict how much iron and magnesium is present in that olivine on the Martian surface. And when I do that uh, for the olivine we've analyzed in Gale Crater, I found that it contains significantly more iron than what we generally observe on Earth, which was interesting. And it tells us uh, one of two things, either the Martian olivine crystallized at a lower temperature than what we generally see on Earth, or that the magma it crystallized from had a significantly higher iron component than what we generally have on Earth. What's really nice about this technique is that we can do this for all of the mineral phases that we found in Gale Crater, not just olivine. And furthermore, the Kemen instrument was not originally intended to do this. So after the launch, we were actually able to use uh, this technique and these principles to essentially retrofit or calibrate Kemen to have a much higher precision than originally planned. And as a result, we've been able to gain a lot more insight about the real composition of minerals on Mars. So what minerals are we finding on Mars other than olivine and gypsum? Uh, here are the two dimensional X-ray diffraction patterns of the first samples we analyzed with Kemen and Gale Crater. The first rock nest was a scooped soil. 
And uh, the second, John Klein, was a drilled mudstone. Each of these green bands you'll see here uh, is uh, in the pattern, you'll see it belongs to a mineral species. And there are some commonalities between the two samples. These commonalities are minerals you would see in a basaltic soil. Let me see, in a basaltic soil, like uh, things like plagioclase, feldspar, pyroxene, uh, minerals you would find on say the Hawaiian islands, which is where these photos are from. That's not Mars. Um, but the major difference between the two is the phyllosilicate or clay mineral band we're seeing near the bottom of the pattern. What we're seeing here is the first definitive proof of a long-standing body of water on Mars. This clay mineral formed as the result of olivine crystals sitting in water for a very long time. Not only do we know that there was water and that the parent material was olivine, but based on the type of clay mineral, we know that the water in Gale was fresh and it had a neutral pH. This is very promising as an environment that could have hosted life. It was a very comfortable, hospitable place that was not too harsh at all. So what other minerals have we found? Uh, and what do they tell us? So to date, Kemen has analyzed over 25 samples and we're currently in the process of analyzing more as we speak. In fact, as soon as we finish here, I'm gonna go work on that. Um, and uh, so, so what have we found? We generally find a suite of minerals associated with basaltic rocks, like those of Hawaii I mentioned earlier. These include uh, plagioclase, feldspar, and magnetite, which we've observed in nearly every single sample we've analyzed with Kemen and other common rock forming silicate minerals, such as uh, pyroxenes, which include pigeonite, augite, and orthopyroxene, uh, as well as olivine and alkali feldspar. And then uh, we've often found minerals associated with weathering and alteration, especially clay minerals. We found a range of clay minerals that form in different environments. Some were likely more habitable than others, but what they all have in common is long standing water on the surface or near subsurface. Likewise, we've observed gypsum and other associated calcium sulfates that provide further evidence of longstanding bodies of water. Uh, lastly, we've occasionally, occasionally found jerosite, which is a hydrous sulfate, and it's commonly associated with acidic conditions. So, so there were likely areas and time periods during Gale Crater's long history that environments had a lower than neutral or acidic pH. Then lastly, I'll mention uh, two puzzling phases. The first is tritomite, which we found in only one very unusual sample in Gale Crater. Tritomite is basically quartz, but it formed at a higher temperature, so its structure is a little different. On Earth, it's associated with rocks similar to granite, but uh, Mars has long been thought to not have much, if any, of this type of rock. So it's been puzzling for us to find this, and we're still trying to figure out how it got there. So we're definitely encountering some mysteries. And the second puzzling piece is the X-ray amorphous material. This X-ray amorphous simply means that the material doesn't bounce X-rays in a regular way like I showed you earlier. This can happen for two reasons. One is that the crystals are simply too small. They don't have enough long range repeated order. And the other is that there are not, um, they are not crystalline at all. And instead their atoms are arranged randomly like you would have in a glass. Uh, we found that each sample contain, that we've analyzed contains between 20 and 70% X-ray amorphous material. And this is very different from what we see in rocks and most rocks on Earth. So we're still working very hard to understand the nature and formation of these materials. And it, it's very likely that they are the product of weathering and alteration, but we can't be certain at this stage. This is where sample return would be incredibly useful. So in, in closing, I've thrown a lot of information at you very quickly. So I'd like to just take a step back and, and synthesize this a bit. The rocks and minerals we observe in Gale Crater tell us that there have been various stages of mineralization and environmental evolution and cycling throughout its history. These stages include extensive volcanism, which we know from the basaltic minerals I mentioned earlier, like olivine, plagioclase, and pyroxene, and of course the many volcanoes dotting the surface of Mars. There's also been significant weathering and alteration by wind and fluids, which is clear from the sand dunes and windblown sedimentary structures, as well as the sedimentary structures formed by moving and standing water. And of course, we've observed minerals associated with alteration by water like clays and gerocyte. We also have evidence of large, long-standing bodies of fresh water that went through wet and dry periods, causing evaporation and deposition of evaporite minerals, namely gypsum and other related phases. The nature and distribution of these rocks and minerals gives unambiguous evidence for a dynamic hydrosphere, which is a critical component of planetary habitability. 
So basically, we already know that the necessary chemical elements are present. So that is sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and uh, phosphorus. We've now definitively confirmed through X-ray diffraction that there was a long-standing water regime on Mars. And we've also discovered that there was a significant geologic cycling. These are all components needed for a habitable environment. And with that, I'd like to just once again thank, uh, thank my hosts and thank you all for tuning in. If you would like more information, please check out the Mars Exploration website or the Mars Science Laboratory website. I've also put up uh, my, my website as well as the Carnegie 4D Initiative website as well if you'd like to learn a little bit more about my work. And with that, I think I will take questions. Thank you so much, Shauna. That was a wonderful and timely presentation. We had questions pouring in from pretty much the minute you started talking. So we have a lot to get through. Um, Great, let's do it. I'm going to start out with we have several people asking about the winds that you talked about and showed with the dust devils and uh, they want to know what generates those winds and also for these uh, samples that Perseverance will be setting aside to be returned later, how do we ensure that they don't just get buried by debris uh, blown about by those winds? Yeah, I love this question um, because I watched The Martian and I loved it and it was such a good movie. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it. It's amazing. Um, the author of the book openly admitted that he knew that the scene in which the 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 view the spacecraft is shaking and they have to get off the planet was was not actually factual in any way um because the atmosphere is too thin so actually if you have a spacecraft it could be you know winds whipping by a hundred something miles an hour and it it really would do very little to a spacecraft and very little to the sample tube so we see this dust devil and it looks very intense and and like it's really moving stuff and it, and it is, but the, the size of the material that it's moving is tiny, tiny, tiny. I mean, very small, think smaller than a grain of sand at the beach. This is very small stuff. So actually we really don't have to worry about that. And that, that's pretty nice for, uh, you know, when astronauts are going there, we don't have to worry about our spacecrafts getting toppled over. Um, and the winds are generated uh, due to temperature differences, uh, which is, is what we have also on Earth. So changes in temperature causes air to move, basically, and that's what causes the wind. And they're really cool, right? They're so neat. <laughs> they are so cool. I think I could just watch those. Yeah, double me too. Me too. Loop. Um, so I think you're going to like this question. It seems perfectly tailored to you. All right. um, Niels asks, if if life had existed on Mars, how would that show up in its mineralogy? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I didn't go much into this. Um, there, are, there are some direct uh, mineral biosignatures, minerals that precipitate directly from life. These are things like shells, you know, shells at the beach. Uh, those, are, those are minerals. Those are made of calcite or aragonite, which is calcium carbonate. These are things that life directly precipitated. Um, but life also creates a very unique environments. And so it creates these unique chemical environments where we form these kind of strange and rare mineral species. And it actually turns out on earth, we have an incredible mineralogical diversity. We have over 5,000 mineral species. And a lot of that is due to life and what life has done to our planet, changing its atmosphere, changing these small environments. Um, so basically that's what you kind of want to be looking for is mineralogical diversity. You know, are there a lot of, of minerals? Um, so really in order to understand that on Mars, uh, the Kemen instrument can go down to about 1% uh, of a sample. So we know everything that's there down to 1%, but some of these unique phases may be less than 1% of the sample. So in order to determine if we're seeing that kind of mineralogical diversity, we really need sample return to make that happen. But that's, that's the, kind of the two ways that we would figure that out. That's fantastic. I thought you would enjoy that. Uh, this is another great question that relates to a lot of work uh, being done on Car at Carnegie by you and some of your colleagues. Um, so Phil wants to know, are there environments on Earth that can sort of inform how we look at what's going on at Mars, maybe dry lake beds or former ocean beds, things like that? 
um, and how do we make those comparisons? That's a great question. I love that question too. Um, you guys are asking such good questions. So uh, absolutely, uh, in the same way that Earth is a is a or Mars is an analog for early Earth, there are plenty of an analogous sites on Earth uh, that are like Mars is uh, today, or like it likely was in its history, maybe when it had an atmosphere, or when it had water. Uh, one of the one of the places people often go is the Atacama Desert. Uh, and that is, it, it has a lot of the same minerals. It's incredibly dry. Um, it's one of the drier places on earth. One of, one of the issues is getting an atmosphere that is remotely as dry as Mars is, is impossible on our planet. Um, but there are certainly sites, um, uh, volcanoes and things like that. Uh, sometimes people often go to Iceland uh, to look at the kind of live, uh, to think about what it was like when Mars was more uh, volcanically active. Uh, so there, there are quite a few, Atacama, um, yeah, volcanoes, things like that. Absolutely. Exciting to imagine standing in a place on earth and kind of thinking that you're in a Mars analog while you're absolutely, there. Absolutely, absolutely. It's very cool field work. Svalbard is another place, which if anyone knows what Svalbard is, it's, it's uh, a territory uh, north of Norway. It's, they have polar bears. Uh, it is, you know, you have to have a polar bear gun, I think. I mean, it's a very intense place to go. Um, you can talk to one of our staff scientists, uh, uh, Andrew Steele, who, who's been there and he's told me stories about the, about the polar bears. Um, but that's that's another Mars analog site. When, and Kemen was actually taken there to do testing as well as the SAM instrument uh, on, on the Curiosity rover. So they did testing there as if they were on Mars. That actually perfectly leads into the next question, which is Harrison asking how rovers are tested before they're deemed ready to go and survive on Mars. Guys, these questions are so good. Okay, um, I was most excited about the q and I'm not gonna lie, I love, I love these questions. Um, it's so exciting to talk about, it. it's so fun. So uh, there are a number of ways that they're tested. So they do, uh, you know, laboratory testing is kind of the, the early stage. You know, people start thinking about what, what information do I wanna gain? What do, what engineering, thing do I need to do on this planetary body? And so they'll start thinking about it, just, you know, maybe doing some prototypes in the lab. When you start getting to the point where you have an instrument that you're proposing to NASA for a mission, um, you're gonna actually go out and do field studies. And, uh, you know, the farther along you get on the, the process, the more you try to make these sites analogous to the, to the planetary body that you wanna go to. In the case of Mars, you know, the very late stage testing for the Kemen instrument and the SAM instrument was to go to Svalbard. Um, but, you know, they'll do analog testing in Iceland, they'll do analog testing in Atacama and in a number of deserts usually is where it is, which is most fitting. Um, and yeah, so starts in the lab, uh, ends up in the field. And so a question that's kind of the flip side of that one that I have from Barbara is, how are the landing sites for these rovers selected on Mars? Yeah, that's a great question too. So it is a long process and it is a process by committee, basically. Um, it is, uh, so to select Jezero Crater, which is where Perseverance is going, it has this gorgeous Delta deposit. Um, it took five years of discussion. So there are meetings where planetary scientists, people who are interested in, in this type of work or who've worked on missions, or, you know, Mars, Mars scientists, uh, come together to talk and debate and argue and and you know put forth the site that they think is the best location and why and discuss that as a community and you know you start with a big broad list and you narrow down narrow down narrow down and so over the five year period um, I mean I think they just selected Jezero a year or two ago so not even terribly long before the mission actually launched so it's, it's a long process, lots of talking. There's not, you know, one person at NASA doesn't say, this is where we're gonna go. Uh, it's very much so a community decided thing. And engineering also plays a role in that. We have to be able to traverse the terrain. Uh, so that is definitely a factor. So it's scientific inter interest and can we actually do it? That's fantastic. So moving uh, back to mineralogy uh, for the next question, we have one asking, 
could there be minerals on Mars that are not found on Earth? And if so, is the Kemen instrument capable of detecting them or understanding them? Yeah, so there certainly could be. So the answer is yes and yes. Um, there certainly could be minerals on, on Mars that we don't have on Earth. Um, minerals are a product of their formational environment. So if there are physical or chemical conditions, um, you know, a unique chemistry that for some reason we just haven't had on Earth. So the same elements we have, but maybe a different relative, different relative proportions of those atoms. And, you know, in combination with a different pH or temperature or pressure than what we're seeing on Earth, you absolutely could form something that, that we either have never had on Earth, that we had earlier in our history that is now gone. Uh, you know, we have an incredibly active planet. Plate tectonics is turning everything over. We do not have a lot of very old rocks, right? That's one of the reasons why it's so important to go to Mars to understand what was going on. Um, a lot of our oldest rocks have been destroyed. So we have very few examples. So there were minerals that existed for on Earth at that time, they, they could have been lost. Um, and, and there could also be minerals that we just haven't found on Earth, so we haven't characterized them. And so the second part of that question is, what would we do in Kemen if we found one of these phases? Uh, we, would, we would be able to tell that it didn't exist within the library of mineral fingerprints that we already have. So we would know that something was unusual and uh, we would be able to characterize uh, basically what that, what kind of what that crystal structure looks like. We call it um, the unit cell parameters. So that's basically the, the length, width, and height of the building block that creates that mineral. And uh, we would be able to determine what that is. Determining its chemistry would be hard because that technique that I developed uh, really only works if I can do data mining on what people have done in the lab. So that would be tricky to figure out what exactly what elements were there, but we could certainly figure out that it was something new and more or less what its crystal structure is. Amazing to imagine <laughs> that, that that could potentially yeah, happen. That's exciting. So we have a couple of questions about uh, water formerly existing on Mars. Um, you talked about long standing water. So if you could give some context for what does long mean and then also what happened to the water? Where did it go? It's a good question. Both good questions. Um, yeah, so basically Mars had a magnetic field, uh, just like we do early in its history, and it lost that magnetic field at some point in time, so billions of years ago. So talk about time scale. Um, and, and once it did that, it doesn't have the protection from the solar radiation. That it, it that it once had, and so solar so solar radiation will really just whip away any of these elements that are in a gas or liquid state. They can really just be basically burned off and and lost to space. So that's very likely what happened to a lot of Mars water. There is still water on Mars. There is definitely still water in the subsurface, um, but not not nearly as much as there was previously. And and to talk about time scales. Um, I'm a geologist, so it's funny when we when we talk about you know time. It's like oh, that happened a really long time ago. I'm talking you know four billion years ago, um, not you know a hundred years ago. So uh, the those are the kind of time scales we're talking about, billions of years. Um, as far as the long-standing bodies of water, we're more so talking on the order of thousands, millions of years. Um, so not not billions, but you know thousands to a, a few millions of years. It takes a long time. Uh, so you basically take a, a rock and, and sit it in, in water. And how long do you think that would take to dissolve and turn into clay minerals? A long time. So quite a while, millions of years. Very, very long standing by human lifetime standards. And that actually leads perfectly into another question, something you mentioned in answering this previous question. Um, Philip asked about uh, Mars having lost its magnetic field and are there things that your work can do to inform us of why that might've happened? 
Yeah. So insight is, is really, I think, going to tell us a lot. So that's going to be uh, what insight is going to be able to do. Uh, hopefully if they get enough seismic activity, which they're getting quite a bit, is basically image the interior of Mars. We have a pretty decent understanding of the interior of Mars, but it's based on, on models and what we can detect based on mass and things like that from, from being far away. Um, so we, we think we more or less know that Mars is, is solid through. It no longer has a molten outer core, which is what our planet has and which is what gives us our magnetic field. So Mars likely, because it's smaller, it's about half the diameter of Earth, it likely just cooled more quickly. Um, perhaps there were some other factors involved in that, um, but in general, the issue is that it just cooled quickly and more quickly than we did, and therefore it lost its magnetic field. But as far as the actual structure and interior, and if there was, if there was or is tectonic activity on Mars, Insight is really going to provide a lot of useful information. And there are minerals that are associated with tectonic activity on Earth, so we certainly could detect something like that. But it's really thought that if if there was plate tectonics on on Mars, it's very young and not not very developed, not like what we have on Earth. So uh, if if there was some kind of tectonic activity like that, it wouldn't look exactly like what it was on Earth, but we still might be able to find some minerals that we could say, ah, it might be associated with some of these processes. And we have a couple of questions uh, from Craig and Jessa wanting to know uh, on current rovers or maybe planned future missions, how deep are we able to look into Mars and how much deeper is there to learn about? Yes, yeah, so deep, so deep. We can drill so deep. It's like a few centimeters. <laughs> so there is so much we don't know. Uh, uh, Perseverance is going to be able to dig, dig a little bit deeper. I forget how long it is, but I mean, we're talking, uh, I think on the order of inches, forgive me if I'm, I'm wrong on that, um, but it's not very deep. Uh, and uh, what has been able to dig deeper, I think a few meters, I believe, is Insight with the temperature, ther with the thermometer that they're putting down. They have a really, there's a very cool video that everyone should check out online uh, where they basically call the thermometer, it's like a mole. And so it's this cute video of a mole digging down into the earth to check the earth's temperature. Uh, and it's, it's pretty neat. So they dig much deeper and can, can check the temperature, but of course they don't have the mineralogical or, or chemical instruments to be able to test there. But uh, there are definitely things in, in the works. There's a lot of instrumentation that's being tested in various places like Svalbard and Iceland and Greenland uh, to, to try to develop some of these uh, digging techniques. The issue is that drilling is hard. And if, if there is something that can possibly go wrong with one of these instruments, it's very expensive to send a mechanic to fix it. So you really want instruments that you know are not going to fail and are not extremely complicated and don't require things to be fixed because we're not going to be able to fix them, right? There, that the technology that would go into that is is very difficult. So you really, it's hard to dig deep. I mean, drilling on on Earth is difficult enough, right? It requires a lot of manpower and a lot of oversight. So they're definitely working on the more automated ways of doing that safely, and it'll happen absolutely. We will dig much deeper in the in the near future, um, but right now we're pretty shallow. Is there any way that uh, radar or something could be used to look deeper through a like bouncing something like that Absolutely. Hard to send to Mars. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, and so they're doing this. Um, they've actually been uh, using this a lot to image the ice caps and they found that there is a uh, liquid under the ice caps and things like that. So yeah, you can use ground penetrating radar and things like that. And, and people have done that. Absolutely. Um, to understand like what the, what the shallow and I think pretty deep, subsurface is. That's not my area of expertise, but uh, it's certainly happening. And like I said, I know they've used it extensively to image the uh, the ice caps and found there's, I don't know if you guys remember the big news a few years ago where we're saying there's a an ocean under the ice caps. Yeah. And that's how they did it. They did it with radar. Wonderful. So we only have time for one last question. We have so many that we didn't get to. So 
for any of the folks tuning in. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to email yours to events at carnegiescience.edu and we will pass that along to Shauna who's graciously agreed to answer questions. I love uh, hearing them. So I'm gonna ask Shauna the last question and then uh, our president Eric Isaacs will conclude the program with some final remarks. Uh, so Shauna, we have two very similar questions from uh, Robbie and Steve who wanna know when you think a uh, mission that has humans uh, as part of it will go to Mars and uh, should a mineralogist be part of that mission uh, when the time comes? Well, I mean, you know the answer to the second part of that question. I, I might be biased, but you know the answer to that, right? Um, I think that there should be a mineralogist and I'll selflessly volunteer. Um, you know, I'm very gracious, sure, sure, I guess. Um, so I've actually forgotten what the first part of the question was now. I'm so excited about the mineralist. When, when will people go? Okay. Um, so that depends on who you ask. If you ask Elon Musk, you know, not long. Uh, if you ask me, uh, I think it's going to be significantly longer. You know, there are a lot of engineering hurdles to overcome as far as, uh, the long space flight, the getting getting something of that size off the surface, which uh, SpaceX has made amazing, amazing advances in their rockets. Uh, they're reusable rockets. You know, they're, they, they've actually taken humans to the space station now. Uh, they've been delivering cargo for many years. Uh, they're, they're having great success with their Falcon Heavy rocket, which of course is the most powerful rocket in use aside from the Saturn V rockets, which are no longer in use and are what were used to get the astronauts to Apollo. So this is something where starting to think about, you know, okay, maybe we could actually use something like this to, to get to Mars. So, uh, so SpaceX is doing amazing stuff with the technology that I think will actually speed up that process a lot. But there are a lot of considerations. You know, it's a long journey. Uh, it's very long. It takes seven months minimum to get there and you'll have to wait for a similar, you know, close proximity window to come back. So we're talking a mission that is years and years and years in which you need to provide oxygen, food and water for humans. So, and medical care, right? So this is, um, this is a huge endeavor. So I do not see that happening uh, in the very near future, but you know, amazing things happen when people put their mind to it. So I hope that it's sooner than I think that it will be, you know, we're going to go to the moon definitely soon. Uh, we've, we've done that before. So we understand more about how to actually do that. And so I think that will happen in, in the near future and, uh, you know, within the next 10 years, probably, um, hopefully. And that will really tell us a lot about what we need to do to be able to go to Mars safely. Right. That will really be a, a, a great testing ground uh, for figuring out what we can do there. And also, I think they should send a mineralogist to the moon as well. Yeah. There's still a lot more uh, to, that we need to figure out about the moon. It tells us a lot about our history as well um, in a different way than Mars, but uh, there's still a lot to be discovered there as well. So mineralogist on every mission, yes. Well, thank you, Shauna, for a great and timely talk. Um, I guess uh, we're hopeful that the, the first mission back to the moon and to Mars, uh, they consider scientists in their first priority and that we'll pull for you to be on that flight. So thank you. Um, I also very excited about uh, Curiosity continuing to have great discoveries. As you said, there are years left in that program and, in, and then the perseverance, which to follow up on the really tantalizing evidence that you presented here today for some of the elements of life. So possibly within 10, 15 years, we'll know a lot more about, about all these things. Uh, I also wanna thank you, our audience, for, uh, for being, being here with us, for supporting us, uh, and for your great questions. This is always uh, amongst the most fun parts of these, these uh, virtual lectures. I mentioned this was our last for the summer, but please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be starting our series again, our public lecture series again, uh, very soon in uh, late summer, probably early fall, and we'll let you know. So thank you all again, and good afternoon.